We are getting ready for a concert with Paul and Storm. But first, let me introduce Mr. John Scalzi. It's Paul and Storm and John Scalzi and Pat Rothfuss plus Sean and McGuire and a little bit of Amber Benson as well. So you're really getting your, you're getting your, your, your entertainment dollar tonight. Uh, and if you don't like it, then of course you get a full refund. Go and talk to the people in the back. I'm sure they'd be more than happy to give you everything back. My thing today is that I'm going to uh, do a little bit of stand-up for you, which I've never done before, so lucky you! And then uh, just move from there. I'm actually really excited because uh, I love coming to Phoenix. This is like my fifth time here at Phoenix Comic Con. And uh, it's always just really exciting to, to come back and just come fly in, get into Phoenix, step outside of the airport and burst into flame. <laughs> right? It's like, oh, here we are. You know, and here comes my wife. Here comes a, a family of five. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, I miss that so much. <laughs> there are things, I just imagine, I, in my brain, every time I come here, I just imagine the people standing outside the airport with fire extinguishers going, you know, it's like, welcome to Phoenix. <laughs> Taxi. <laughs> it's just a very uh, exciting moment to come back and just the, the thing that gets me about the thing that gets me about Phoenix. And I grew up in LA, so I know a little bit from heat, right? Phoenix is not exactly you know unknown to me. But the thing that that really gets me about Phoenix is they sit there and they're like, well, you know what? At least it's a dry heat. <laughs> What does that even mean? It's a dry heat. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in Ohio where it's got like 80% uh, humidity and it'll be like 90 degrees, right? And that's pretty miserable. You go outside and you're just like, I want to die, right? And so you come to Phoenix and they're like, it's a dry heat. It's like, yes, but it's like 50,000 degrees hotter, right? The balance is not really exactly you know, it's pretty much evenly matched. You know, the dry heat thing doesn't work. All it means is that when you get out into the air, you start desiccating immediately. You just squirt moisture from your body, and then suddenly you have a very real and intimate knowledge of what it is to be a Slim Jim, right? <laughs> that there are 100,000 people who have just become nerd jerky in cosplay. It's such a it's such a lovely smell. So but but I come back anyway and I don't think it's just selective amnesia. It's actually that I have some really wonderful memories of being here in Phoenix and at this particular Comic Con. And one of my one of my favorite actual memories is from last year where I was in the green room, which is where they keep the celebrities because they can't actually let them mingle with you guys because you'll mob them and, and tear them apart because with your love, <laughs> which you're not supposed to do by the way, actually let them live. And, um, and I'm back there and I'm wearing a t-shirt that says, uh, I'm here to usurp your narrative. And that's for a writing term, what that means is that actually you, when you're writing characters, there was always that minor character who's always super sarcastic that you really love having out there, and you just end up keep writing him so much that he becomes like the main character, like Falstaff in, in uh, Shakespeare is a perfect example of that. So I was sitting there with this t-shirt that says, I'm here to usurp your narrative, and I'm sitting next to Nichelle Nichols, you know, who played Uhura, and she's reading my shirt, and she's like, I'm here to usurp your narrative. And she stands up and she gets ready to go. And she, as she's leaving, she leans in. She's like, I'd like to usurp that T-shirt. <laughs> and she walks off. And I'm there, I'm like, what just happened? <laughs> Does she like the T-shirt? Was she, was she hitting on me? I'm, Either way, that's fine with me. 
and uh, and then you know I told I told friends about this and they 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 understand that I have this you know sensitivity about the issue of harassment and they were like I think Michelle Nichols harassed you I'm like no that was all about consent there <laughs> oh. but honestly uh, one of the other things that I really like about uh, Phoenix Comic Con is that there's always a lot of families, you'll see them coming around, and, and also in cosplay, you know, like you'll see, like Galadriel, and you'll see Gandalf, and they're the mom and dad, and they have a bunch of little hobbits running around, and you're like, they, look, they're, they're doing the nerd parent thing right, it's so awesome, and you know, speaking as a nerd parent, you know, I often, I often worry about whether or not I'm raising my daughter right, by the, the whole nerd concept, right? Um, and the, the thing about it is, uh, my daughter is just, she's 15 years old now, you know? And one of the things that I was always worried about when I was, like, my wife was pregnant, and we we're like sitting there going, well, what is our child going to be like? And I already knew it, she was like, I'm gonna be sarcastic, you know? But the, the thing that always got me is like, I would have been, here's the thing, I would have been okay if our daughter had been born and she had had some sort of, you know, developmental or, or mental uh, issues. You can, you can deal with that. You can love your kid because that's the, that's the hand you're dealt with, right? And I was like, it doesn't matter whatever happened to my daughter, physically or mentally, I would still love her to death because she's, you know, she's my kid and that's going to be wonderful. I don't know what I would have done if my daughter had been born she was boring, <laughs> right? You're like, what do you, what do you do with it? It's like, uh, what are you doing, baby? He's like, oh, nothing. I guess just watching some TV again, you know. And so, I was always looking for those signs, those early signs that she was that she was kind of going in in the nerd direction because that would have been fun. And one of the first, it just made me kind of so proud was like very early on that she, she watched me as I was watching Monty Python and the Holy Grail, right? As you do, because you have that on, because nerd. And, um, and then one, one uh, evening, she wasn't feeling particularly well, and you know, and she was like lying in bed, and my, my wife and I were back there, and we were talking, like, yeah, I mean, she's like, she's not feeling well, I think, you know, she's just, just not feeling well at all. And in, in, in the background, this little three-year-old voice going, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> and my heart just filled with love for my child. Because she got it. I'm okay with this. Uh, later on, she, uh, it was, she became eight years old. And eight years old is the time the time when you watched Star Wars for the first time. Because I was eight when Star Wars came out, right? And I went to go see it in the movie theater, and it just, you know, it starts off and you have that huge swell of John Williams music, and it's just, you know, and here comes a spaceship, and it goes zoom, and you're like, that's awesome. And then all of a sudden you hear this, and here comes that triangle, that's the Imperial Cruiser, and it, and it comes, and it, and it comes and it keeps coming. And I'm just sitting there like <gasps> And that's when I became a man. <laughs> so eight years old, it's the right time. It is the right time to teach your children about Star Wars. So she we go and we put on Star Wars. Star Wars not the new hope because fucking George Lucas, right? <laughs> And we watch it, and she enjoys it, she's having a good time with it, and then it's done, and it's her bedtime. And I say, okay, it's, it's time for your bed. And she's like, well, can I have some ice cream first? And I'm like, no, it's 9 o'clock, it's your bedtime. You may not have any ice cream right now. Well, I don't even know why you're asking me this. And she's like, fine. You will give me ice cream. <laughs> You know, and, and somewhere along the way she started doing her own thing. She started watching, she watched Dr. Horrible without any prompting. She's very, you know, very proud about that. 
Uh, she uh, then, you know, she started watching a lot of anime. You know, she started doing all this sort of stuff, and I can't keep up with her anymore. You know, it's, it's like, like when you're mainstream people, like they get the thing where your kid starts listening to music that you don't listen to, and it's like, well, I, when I was younger, the music was much better. And I can't even do that because when I grew up, all the Saturday morning cartoons genuinely and truly sucked. You know, six frame filmation, animation, and terrible, horrible stuff. So, but she's off on her own thing. And, I, and once uh, I'm proud of her, but at the same time, because she did, in fact, grow up sarcastic, I don't know how that happened, uh, she, uh, she begins to needle me about, you know, stuff. She'd be like, Dad, hey, Dad, hey, 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 Dad, Dad, what? Battlefield Earth, Dad. I'm like, what? No, shut up. Don't. No, dad, dad, hey, what, dad, dad, what, what? Matrix Revolutions, dad. <laughs> Shut up, stop talking to dad, what, dad, dad, jar, jar, dad. <laughs> you know we don't use the J word in this house. Dad, dad, what, what? Red matter, dad. <laughs> you go to your room and you think of what you just said. I, uh, I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you, I, um, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of Red Matter. Uh, I'm not, a, I like the new Star Wars films, but I, uh, Star Trek films, yes, that's just, that's how angry I am at the moment. But it's just like, there's that, there's that scene, there's that scene with Spock. The old Spock. I'm sorry, I'm going to spoil anything. No, I'm not. <laughs> Where he is, you know, he meets the new Kirk, and, you know, he starts talking about how he got thrown back in time, right? And the first thing he says, you know, goes on this monologue, and Spock, Ambassador Spock, formerly Science Officer Spock, Science Officer Spock, goes, a star exploded, threatening the entire galaxy. And immediately went like, because an entire a star is not going to threaten the entire galaxy if it explodes. He's like, you know, and he talks about the shock wave coming to destroy uh, Romulus, right? And I'm like, no, yes, they're okay. The shock wave is coming. If it's coming at you know regular, you know, it's like yes, it will be a problem for Romulus in eight hundred thousand years. And it's just. I just get angrier and angrier and angrier. And then my wife stops the film. She says, you leave the room now. <laughs> you go, you do whatever you need to check email. Go and, you know, get a snack, whatever it is that you need to do. Come back after this thing. Because there's just, I can't rationally deal with science officer Spock starting with bad science and getting much worse from there. It made me so angry that I actually wrote a book about bad science in Star Trek. And I'm one of the fucking you guys. <laughs> so I guess in one way I have J.J. Abrams to thank for my Hugo. <laughs> Thanks, J.J. But seriously, so, but I'm, I'm actually, all, all things considered, I'm very happy to, to introduce my daughter to the whole nerd life. And because, you know, it's generally been a very positive experience with her. She's really liked her anime. She likes going to the conventions. She has a wonderful time. But there is a, there is a dark side. There is a dark side to the, to the nerd life, to the, the idea that, uh, that nerds have that most everything in the world can be gamified, right? And one of those things that kind of drives me a little bit crazy is this uh, idea of, have you ever heard of the, the pickup artist dudes? Right? Uh, yes, exactly. And they have this thing called the game, which is like all these various like strategies for uh, picking up women and, and doing all this sort of stuff. And it really is like D and D for assholes, right? <laughs> you see a woman in the bar, roll for initiative. You know. <laughs> Plus five line of negging. Right? Because that's, that's the thing that, that, that gets me a little bit crazy, the, the negging thing. 
I don't understand. The concept of negging is that one of the ways that you'll make a, a woman interested in you is to like subtly insult her. You know, it's like, oh, I see you're eating salad. How's that diet working out? That's an example from XKCD. And it's just like, and you're like, really? The, the plan is to, to make a woman interested in you is like to be a total asshole? Now, I'm, I'm old fashioned, but that seems a little bit weird. And the way to, to, I guess, to make people sort of understand the problem with that is maybe like flip it around, right? It's like, imagine you were the dude and some woman was negging on you, right? It's like, I see the neck beard is coming in a little tufty. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm sure it'll all grow in sometime. <laughs> That's a lovely fedora. It really differentiates you from all the other guys in fedoras. That's, that's wonderful stuff. And I just imagine, like, like, what would the, you know, if I was, if I was taking on, on Paul and Storm, right? It'd be like, oh, comedy music. That's very special. You'll get a lot of Grammys for that. Or, or Patrick Rothfuss. Well, you, you write some very big books there, Patrick. I'm sure that's not compensating for anything. <laughs> and they're back there going, you're fucking killing me. <laughs> but that's my point. It's like, why would you actually genuinely like, decide that, you, that, that being a complete dick is the way to actually make a woman like you? And the answer is because you're not really thinking of women as actual humans. You're just thinking of them as, you know, non-player characters in this D&D game for jerks. <laughs> what? Here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I, I will let you in a little secret. If we're talking about, you know, the game of, of relationships, here's the one step that you should do if you actually want to get a woman interested in you. I mean, besides the whole treat her with respect and, you know, as an equal person that possibly would be, you know, someone you would want to spend your entire life developing a relationship with for, you know, for all eternity. Aside from that, here's the thing you do, and I, and I, and I have some knowledge of this. Learn, guys, straight white males, learn how to dance. And I know you're looking at me going, but John Scalzi, have you looked at yourself in the mirror? What could you possibly know about the magic of dance? And the answer to this is actually, I took two years, two years of jazz and modern dance. I know how to dance. It started in high school. Our dance teacher came up to me and said, I need a boy to be in the dance class. It's you, and she, and she walked away, and I didn't have a chance to argue with her. And my friends who were boys, started mocking me for this little, you're gonna be in dance. Oh, that's, that's, that's special. And I was like, you know what, let's actually think about this. Let's actually think about this. I am a young heterosexual male. I have to take PE. Here are my choices. I can spend my PE period moving ryth rhythmically with young women in tight clothing, <laughs> or I can spend my, my time wrestling with boys, thrusting them into a mat with my hips. <laughs> Which is the heterosexual choice? <laughs> so I took dance, I took two years of dance, and what it, it was great because what it taught me was one, to get over the whole, you know, everybody's watching me making an ass of my sort of self. And that's the thing that really gets me is that most guys, when they're like thinking about dancing, they're not thinking about the woman, right? They're thinking about all the other guys. They're thinking about all the other guys who are sitting there like at the wall, not dancing with anybody going, huh, you're an idiot, huh. Dancing with girls, as if that's gonna do you any good. And meanwhile, all the women are like, please dance with me. Why not dance with me? It would be fun to dance with me. And so I, I, I just, here's, here's, the absolute, here's the absolute truth about it, which is that I really believe 
that if we could just get all the guys out there and get them to get over the idea that they have to prove anything to the other guys and focus on the woman that they're dancing <laughs> with, maybe that would lead to something. I'm just a little bit, I'm a little bit crazy about that one. But, uh, and, and I remember a number of years ago at uh, PenguinCon, which is a convention in, uh, in Michigan, that I and my friend Anne led a, a class on, called Dancing for Geeks, right? Where we brought all these geeks in and they were like, we want to learn how to dance. And it was really the sort of remedial thing that, that you're doing. You're like, first, let's walk, let's do walking. And we put on a, you know, and it took them several tries. But they got it. You're like, good, you know, we got the walking down. Now let's do this and clapping. Thumpa clap, thumpa clap, thumpa clap, thumpa clap, thumpa clap. And they kind of got it. And we're like, all right, now here. Here's all you need to do. You got, you got the basic beat. Here's all you do. Put your left foot in. Put your left foot out. Put your left foot in. Shake it all about. Turn yourself around. That's what it's all about. And they're like, oh. And we saw them out there that night and, and dancing, and they were having a wonderful time. And we had to teach them some advanced concept as well. You know, so they got the, they got the movement down. But the, we also let them know, it was like, you know, two things. You know, first thing is, here's, a, here's an actual fact, which is like, if you're dancing out there, the way that you're moving tells a lot about you, not just in terms of how you're dancing, but how you do other things. <laughs> Right? So if you're the guy who's out there dancing and you're kind of going like this. What do we know about that guy? <laughs> Never leaves the missionary position. Right? We have the other guy who's out there kind of going. Maybe he's good with his tongue. <laughs> and then you have this guy who's like that. Premature ejaculation. <laughs> so we told them, pace yourself, be paying attention to your partner. Also, here's a secret thing that, that, that only works. You have to tell heterosexual men about this. Heterosexual men, when they dance, are paranoid about going above this with their arms, right? This is the heterosexual line. And, and why is that? It's like, here's a, here's a heterosexual man dancing. And all of a sudden, on. And they're like, wait a minute, my arms went up. Does that, what does that mean? Does that mean I'm, you know, gay? It's like, no, just because they go up like that will not make you gay. <laughs> Loving another man, having desire for a lifetime relationship based on love and respect and maybe hot sex, maybe that will make you gay. <laughs> and that's fine. But in the meantime, throw your arms up in the air like you don't care. Because that's the whole point. When you're dancing, you're doing it for yourself, you're doing it for the other person, and the other person's gonna know it. They're gonna be sitting there, watching you, how you react to them, watching them move, reacting with them, going back and going forth. It's gonna be lovely. Now here's the thing. I know this because when I was 23 years old, I was in a bar with, by myself, Watching, <laughs> I know, I had to admit that. And I was, I, I was by myself and I was like, look, as long as I'm here, I'm gonna dance. I don't care, I don't know anybody. I'll just be like, hey, do you wanna dance? Hey, do you wanna dance? And so we went and we danced. And unbeknownst to me, the woman who would become my wife came in with her date and saw me out there on the dance floor doing my dance moves, right? Just going back and forth, going, hey, I'm having a good time doing the dancing, here I am. And unbeknownst to me, she's like, what an interesting, amusing dance style. I must get to know that man. So later on, I'm standing there with my coat, and this woman comes my way, and she is 5'10", hair down to here. I am a movie critic at the time, so I interview movie stars, so I have some 
basis when I say the most beautiful woman I have ever seen in my life. My brain is start, starting to rev up like the nerd pickup lines. It's like, you know, hey, are you an are you an oxidizing are you an oxidizing uh duh. Are you an oxidizing reaction because you're so damn hot? <laughs> and she walks up to me and she says, you and I have to dance sometime tonight. And I said, now is good. <laughs> and we danced, and we danced in our very first song, for the those of you who were there earlier today, was Friday I'm in Love. And then we went and we had our first official date, and a year later I proposed, and a year later we got married, and we've been together for 19 years. And this is the point, which is to tell all those guys who are sitting there, you know, going, the pickup artist who's like, you know, that this is all a game. It's like, go ahead, and you go play your game. Because I know how to dance, and I have already conquered the boss level. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I'd like to bring up a, my very special guest tonight. Uh, you know her from Buffy and from many other places, as well as she's a fabulous writer. Her name is Amber Benson. How do I follow that amazing story? It's all true. All right, here's the here's the thing we're gonna read. I'm gonna I, I wrote a little script a couple years ago, and it's called Denise Jones. Super Booker. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Please state your name and occupation. My name is Denise Jones, and I'm the superhero booking coordinator for the International Society of Super Beings, formerly the National League of Super Beings, formerly the Liberty Friends. First off, do you have any superpowers? Not unless booking counts as a superpower, no. I, I got the job through Craigslist. Okay, what does, a, what does a booking coordinator do in the context of super beings? Well, as you know, cities and countries all over the world are under constant threat from terrorists, organized crime, natural disasters, arch villains, and monsters, both alien and supernatural. When these cities and countries find themselves under attack, they'll give me a call, and I'll find them a super being affiliated with the ISSB to help them deal with whatever crisis they're dealing with at the moment. Okay, so if you're saying, like, Chicago were attacked by a sewer monster or something, the mayor would have to go through you to, to get help from Arachnolad. No, Chicago keeps Arachnolad on a retainer. The evening stalker, too. Most large cities have one or two super beings under contract. So, Chicago pays Arachnolad for protection. You make it sound like a mob racket. It's more like a consulting and services fee. In exchange for certain considerations, Chicago can expect Arachnolad to be a first responder to any arch-villain or monster attack, with a certain number contractually agreed to nights and evenings in which Arachnolad freelances against common thugs and criminals for uh, deterrence purposes. Okay, so, but when you're saying certain considerations, you're, you're talking about, about money. Sure. The kind of goes against the idea of super beings doing this sort of thing out of the goodness of their own hearts. Well, do you work for free? No, but I'm not a super being. Even super beings have to eat. I, I thought that was what secret identities were for, so that they could have bill-paying jobs. Super beings haven't had day jobs since pagers and blackberries hit the market. There's no way you can get away from work anymore. And when Chicago is being attacked by a sewer monster, it doesn't want to have to wait for a Ragno lad to find some clever way to sneak out of a sales meeting. That's just stupid. <laughs> okay, Chicago and a Ragno lad notwithstanding, walk us through how someone would get a super bean out of here. All right, as I said before, most of the major cities in the U.S. have a super bean or two on retainer. So the calls I get are usually from mid-sized cities. But like, uh, Oklahoma City. Oklahoma said he actually just put the Invisible Avenger in the retainer. I thought he was in Seattle. He was. Oklahoma offered him better terms. You know how it is. Cities get ambitious. So, not Oklahoma City. Let's say... 
Fresno. <laughs> Fresno it is. Fresno has no in-house super being, so when disaster strikes, they give me a call. We look at the nature of their issue, who among the ISSB roster is available and appropriate, and then work to find someone who can respond on an expedited basis. Okay, so let's say Fresno is being attacked by a monster. What kind of monster? A big one. That's not specific enough. Is it an alien monster? Is it some sort of mutated animal? Is it shooting laser beams out of its eyes? Or does it have fire breath? Can it fly? Is it actually a massive colony of smaller creatures that form together and combine intelligences? <laughs> All of this matters, you know. Yeah, but if your city's under attack, I don't think you have time to stop the monster and ask it what its weaknesses are. Of course not. That's why we have the standard questionnaire. <laughs> the monster's attacking and you have a questionnaire. Oh, it's not that long. And by that point, city officials are motivated to respond quickly. Okay. Let's say it's a Gila lizard large enough to stomp a car that shoots poisons from its tear duct. Good. That's a class 4 monster, which is our classification for non-sentient mutated animal species with the poison casting subclassification. Now, if this were a real emergency, I would check the ISSB database. But off the top of my head, I can tell you that there are three ISSB affiliated super beings that could respond in under an hour with powers that would be useful for this particular mission. Battling Tiger in Glendale, Electrobot in Emeryville, and Brian Garcia in San Jose. <laughs> Brian Garcia. Yes. What about him? Uh, it's just not the usual sort of super being name. He's new. <laughs> and he thinks the super being masked identity thing is kind of silly. He fights in jeans and a t-shirt. <laughs> Whatever makes him happy. I admire someone comfortable with their own identity, so let's pick him. Then from there, what we do is check his availability, agree on a consulting fee, and fax over waivers to be signed by the appropriate local authorities. What kind of waivers? Indemnity for property damage, mostly. Right. Because that usually happens. It depends. Supervillains are generally respectful of property, contrary to popular belief. Because they usually have some economic goal in mind, and it's hard to put a city to work if you've blown up all the buildings with lasers. <laughs> But class four monsters, yeah, big time. They claw through skys the skyscrapers looking for people to snack on. A super being shouldn't be on the hook for that. Okay, but cities wouldn't really try to collect from a uh, uh, super being that saved their bacon, would they? Are you kidding? <laughs> the owners of the destroyed properties try to collect on their insurance. The insurance companies try to sue the city for negligence, and the city tries to pass the buck onto the super being. Happened in Tempe in 1993. <laughs> the Crimson Valkyrie defeated the gelatinous menace and then lost everything she had. Had quit. She works in a Jersey toll booth now. That's terrible. No, it's terrible for Tempe. Their calls don't get returned around here. <laughs> They've been swallowed by the gelatinous menace six times since then. Oh, it's hell on property values. But the good news others, is that other cities saw Tempe covered in goo and decided that trying to roll the blame for the damage onto the super being just wasn't the way to go. Fair enough. Although they're totally identified, super beings don't have any motivation not to level a city to, to get at the monster. I'm sure they do. <laughs> Most of the city contracts offer bonuses to the super being if the overall property damage is, say, below 10 million. The exact figure varies from case to case, but that's the amount in the standard contract. There's a standard contract. Sure. When a monster is devouring your citizens like Pez, you don't want to haggle too long. I, I guess not. I mean, this is sort of why super beings join ISSB in the first place. Freelance monster fighting seems appealing at first blush, especially for those super beings who are moody and have problems working in a team setting. But if you show up somewhere and just start cracking skulls, your legal liability goes right through the roof. Seriously. You know what the difference between a super being and a super villain is? Henchman. Contractual indemnification. <laughs> really, in a lot of cases, that's just it. The Sinister Glove started out as a super being, you know. Then he started getting charged for damages and had to turn to crime to claw his way out of the debt hole. It's sad, really. He should have joined the ISSB at the beginning. 
but he didn't want to pay our finder's fee for each mission. Penny wise and pound foolish. Yeah, but the sinister glove is now the uncontested master of Andorra, where he rules with an iron fist. Iron glove. Right. <laughs> and that's an object lesson in what happens when a city, or in this case a principality, tries to cut corners in making a deal with the ISSB. When the sinister glove attacked this army of hyper-intelligent cyborg cats, we offered Andorra a really nice package of three super beings, plus Sparkles the robot dog in his running pack, and an optional assist from Extraordinary Man if required, which isn't something we ever do. He's booked years in advance. And they tried to haggle. <laughs> Wanted to pay in an installment plan, and in euros. We can't take euros. It's not part of our tax deal with the U.S. By the time they were ready to get serious, the cyborg cats had already consumed the Prime Minister and two-thirds of the legislature, and of course, by then it's too late. You could have just had extraordinary men circle the globe backwards and turn back time, and, and then try again. We did. Twice. Same result both times. After a certain point, there's no percentage in trying anymore. And now look at Andorra. The world's smallest villainocracy. Cyborg cats everywhere. Okay. Okay, so you help connect super beings to the places that need their services. But what about, what about their downtime? I mean, I know the ISSB has something like 400 members in the U.S. alone, but typically there's only a single arch-villain or alien monster attack in the U.S. a day. Even if you double up on some of those contracts, you're still looking at a 99.5% unemployment on a day-to-day -day basis. That's right. So, in addition to connecting super beings with cities in need, I also act as a conventional booker and schedule our members for corporate and public events. So, like, what exactly? Motivational speaking gigs are very popular, encouraging people to live up to their potential, that sort of thing. And no one seems to mind the irony of someone with superpowers lecturing ordinary people on reaching their potential. What do you mean? <laughs> I'm just thinking of those corporate events where they have people walk on coals as a way to show they can do anything. For, for a super bean, that's not exactly a great feat. It depends on the super bean. Lubricant girl wouldn't like that particular event. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a super bean named Lubricant Girl. She saved Reno last month from the sandpaper people. <laughs> I missed that one. Oh, she got them before they reached the casinos. Not much of a ride up, but yes, she's one of our more specialized members. Bet she'd be popular at parties. <laughs> In fact, we do book private parties, although, let me be clear, not the sort that you just implied, for which I am offended on behalf of Lubricant Girl. Sorry. <laughs> What kind of parties? Birthdays, weddings, bar mitzvahs. Instead of, say, a clown. I wouldn't put it that way. There's a certain segment of society that enjoys celebrity appearances at their events. We've all heard stories of how some people will get Coldplay or Hannah Montana to play their kid's birthday party. Same concept, different skill set. There, there are indemnity writers on those contracts too? You bet there are. You would not believe how many kids want to go flying with a super being and then eat a bug at 5,000 feet and go screaming to mommy who then tries to sue because her precious snowflake got an unexpected six-legged snack. Parents. Well, parents of the sort that hire super beings for parties. They do tend to come with a certain mindset, if you know what I mean. Sure. Not that they aren't valued partners whom we are very happy to serve. <laughs> of course not. Although it does bring up the question of what happens when one of your super beings is at a bar mitzvah and a monster attacks. Obviously, our super beings' availability for parties is contingent on the absence of monster attacks at the time. Unless the monsters are attacking Tempe. In which case, party on, super beings. <laughs> Seriously? Seriously. Really. Screw Tempe. Those people are on their own. Thank you very much. I was your boy, Act Acton Scalzi, with special guest star Amber Benson. Thank you for, for not throwing fruit at me today.